<laughs> I got you, Miss Fair. Okay. Well, let's get started. Welcome, beautiful people, to the eighth session out of 10 of Collective Courage Book Study with the wonderful Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhart. If this is your first time at a Kepler Institute event, we're a nonprofit organization based in Indianapolis, Indiana, going 20 years strong, dedicated to building community wealth through social enterprise, youth leadership development, and conversations and discussions, events just like the one we find ourselves at right now. And it's thanks to community members like yourselves that we can keep events like this free and accessible to the public. So I highly encourage everyone to visit Kepler.org and help contribute to our annual campaign. We're trying to leverage our social capital to raise $300,000 in donations, and we can only do it with help from all of you. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Indianapolis Recorder newspaper, the premier source of Indianapolis's African-American voices, aiming to empower and educate for over 125 years. They just hit their birthday recently. I uh, want to wow. shout them out for hosting this event. Uh, they've been real good to us. Uh, also, as always, uh, honored to introduce Dr. Jessica gordon Emhart renowned social political columnist specializing in the solidarity economy, community economics, black political economy, and popular economic literacy. Her research and publications explore the African-American community through the lens of cooperative economic development, worker ownership, wealth inequality, and community-based asset building and approaches to justice. Our magnum opus and the book we'll be delving further into tonight, Collective Courage, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice, takes an in-depth look into the socialized approaches of our predecessors. And we're here tonight, as always, to see how we can apply those same approaches today. So without further ado, Dr. Gordon Nemar. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to be here. Um, but we have 11 sessions, not 10. There's 10 chapters, but we started with an introduction. So this is eight You're out right. of 11. Out of 11, my fault. We have two more. Don't forget everybody, we have two more. Uh, they're not on the website. So I just want to make that clear. Let me uh, say two that in now. January. Yeah, we've got one more in December and two in January. Exactly. We have uh, one on the 4th of January and one on the 18th. I think those will be the, the last two. Right. Right. Okay. And Kwanzaa, December 28th. Yes. So 28th, so that's two weeks from now, then the fourth, another two weeks, 18th, another two weeks, as we have been. I know this, this yeah, meeting was kind of weird. So. One in December and two in January. Exactly. Uh-oh, now we've got feedback. Actually, it's the second Monday, right? So it's not the 4th of January, if we're going to be correct here, right? Kwanzaa, December 20th. Let me look, let me look on the um, website because I had it pulled up. Yeah. No, it's the 11th and the, yeah, because yeah, we are, we're right, it's for the second 28th. and fourth, right. Right, and so that means we won't okay, go so. on the fourth, but we'll go on the 11th. So it's the 11th and, and the, the 25th. 25th. Mm -hmm. Okay, my fault, 11th and mm -hmm. the 25th. All right, we got it, we're good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, take it away. So um, happy December, everybody. I'm gonna share my screen, just a couple of slides. Uh, thank you all for having me again. Uh, where's my slideshow? Okay. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks to all the sponsors and all of you wonderful people. Oh, she just texted me. You're not on the internet. <laughs> and today, chapter seven, another one of my favorite chapters. I, I've been saying that about each chapter, haven't I? <laughs> I guess I'm biased. Um, African American women in the co op movement. Uh, I do, I have to say my beginning openings. Let's honor and remember the original stewards of the land, wherever we are, honor all of our ancestors, bring them into the room with us and have them share this. Tonight is a special night to honor black women with chapter seven. And that is a picture of uh, the ladies auxiliary uh, to the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which uh, was doing uh, magnificent co-op education and co-op development work through the, from the 30s to the 50s. And that I believe is an article from maybe an Oakland newspaper about a meeting between two chapters. Um, it's funny that picture was actually given to me by the daughter or the niece of Helena Wilson who heard me talk about the role of Helena Wilson who was the president of the Ladies Auxiliary. 
Um, and she sent me some stuff. She sent me like this picture, this clipping, a picture of Elena Wilson and some other materials just out of the blue because she heard me talking about it. So that's um, right. That's why I keep saying you guys have homework to do because you can find stuff like this about your relatives, your neighbors, the oldest person in your neighborhood. Um, somebody's been involved in some of this kind of stuff or was a member of one of these organizations that were doing co-ops or was part of a co-op. I bet if you keep looking, you're going to find someone who has some co-op files in their basement from when they were in a co-op in the 60s or the 50s or something. Um, we found somebody like that in Harlem once. Um, anyway, uh, let's honor our past, honor Black women today, and happy holidays, but we'll also be celebrating Kwanzaa next time we meet. Um, I also just want to put some pictures up of um, powerful Black women cooperators to bring them into the room even more strongly. Um, most people do not see this picture of Fannie Lou Hamer. There's a bunch of other pictures of her, usually the ones when she's testifying for voting rights. But remember, she was a sharecropper and a farmer, and she also started um, Freedom Farm Co-op. Uh, in Mississippi, and this is I'm not sure if this is actually her at Freedom Farm, but it's definitely her farmer picture. So I wanted to bring her in as a co-op farmer to this space. There's our Ella Jo Baker. Um, I did end up using a pretty standard picture of her um, because she was such a fabulous orator and thought leader so and warrior woman. So I wanted to remember her uh, sort of the urban warrior woman. We had the rural warrior woman. Here's the urban warrior woman and also cooperator, as you all know. Um, Freedom Quilting Bee, I wanted to bring some of our artists in. Uh, from Alabama, uh, and uh, another urban co-op, Ujima Collective from Pittsburgh, um, a collective cooperative of uh, women entrepreneurs doing uh, catering, jewelry, uh, sewing, uh, I forget what else they do. Oh, soap, I think it's soap making herbs. I think one of them might be a masseuse. Uh, so you get, that's the gamut of sort of some, especially 20th and 21st century co-op women that we're gonna try to honor and talk about today. And this is uh, Helena Wilson, who I just mentioned from the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters Ladies Auxiliary. She was president of the auxiliary for about 25 years and basically was the one who pushed, founded, and educated the women on consumer economics and cooperatives um, and promoted cooperative development through, uh, throughout the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and their families. Um, and that, um, I was trying to find a quote from her about went role of women, but uh, I just used this one about how she was talking about us as a people, right, that all groups have used uh, cooperation to protect ourselves and protect our own interests. And we can bring a new order about if we acknowledge the wisdom of uniting ourselves and pooling our funds. And so I think it's appropriate, especially thinking about what's happening, what, what's the new order post COVID, right? Um, and it can be an order where we're pooling our funds for the common good and creating, right? Creating ourselves as a force of strength for our families and communities, the way that Helena Wilson and others have talked about. That's another, that's the other picture that her, I can't remember if it's her daughter, her granddaughter or her niece who sent me. That's also one of the things that got mailed to me. Um, so quickly, um, I'm gonna summarize and then we're gonna go straight to our reflections. Black women, integral part, I think we talked about it already because it comes up earlier, but I wanted to make sure to have a chapter that really focused on women's roles, but we know that they've been an integral part of the Black co-op movement, just like in the Black church, mutual aid societies and civil rights movement, right? In some ways they weren't always highlighted, um, but they were there and important and everybody knew that things didn't happen or wouldn't happen without them. Um, I think because of their strong role in mutual aid societies, that just kind of carried over to their role in co-ops. But also I think if we think about the role of women as sort of keeping communities 
and families, right? We're sort of the, the, the ones keeping everything together and moving and going, then it makes sense that we would be also so strong in the co-op movement. Uh, I'm trying not to be a, um, what do you call it? A female supremacist. <laughs> But you'll see it comes out a little bit. But I'm, I'm trying to, to to squash it a little bit so I don't get too uh, <laughs> too preachy about the role of women. And they said, <laughs> "It's okay. I promise you, Trey and I, and I, I think Kenneth is in here as well. I, I think we can take it if if it really you comes can take it. <laughs> okay. Um. So one and right is <laughs> good." Good. Organizing in the background, right? Doing scud work without glory, but also, especially in the co-op movement, actually being the founders, the presidents, the directors, the, the designers of the co-op activity. And that was what was so exciting to me to see this. It, it was both and, not one or the other. Um, and a lot in the, in the general co-op movement, I noticed in the European and Asian movements, um, a lot of the discussion about women's roles were the opposite. They were saying that women were really in the background. They were never able to be founders, managers, directors. They just kind of were the, the members. Um, but in the black community, um, I found it to be very different. And I'm still trying to figure out why it was so different an experience for black cooperators. Um, but I think it's probably just the role that black women have had to play in general. Um, as I said, as sort of stewards of family and community, that maybe that helps to explain it. Um, and what else? Oh, and the other thing that's really also interesting in the United States is the way that the contemporary worker co-op movement is also dominated by women of color. A lot of the newest, um, fastest growing sectors are um, worker co-ops with um, Latina women, with African immigrant women, uh, with and women co-op worker co-ops in general and so it's also a phenomenon for the 21st century that women and women of color are leaders in the worker co-op movement as well um and so i think we went over this one we went over mutual aid but remember black women had a very strong role in the mutual aid movement right? They asserted leadership as the movement develops. It turns out that more mutual aid societies were women run and, and women focused when you put the whole history of mutual aid together. And so again, that, you know, promoting cohesiveness, developing leadership, asserting leadership at the same time of uh, addressing vital social welfare needs, and then transitioning, right? A lot of the mutual aid societies, people like Helena Wilson, again, she had run a mutual aid association before she even joined the Ladies Auxiliary to the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters before her husband joined the union, which made her a member of the Ladies Auxiliary to the union. She had already been involved in mutual aid and running things. And so she just naturally um, took on another role, first uh, running her chapter in Chicago and then running the whole international Ladies Auxiliary for the International Brotherhood of uh, Sleeping Car Porters. Hopefully you all know who, what the, about the Brotherhood. If you want, you can ask me later if you need me to tell you, bring you up to date on it. This was a little chart that I had in the book, though obviously there's a lot more women. Um, and we could even go back to, remember we talked a little bit about the role of Harriet Tubman in freeing the women who did the Kambahi, uh, Kambi River Society, collectives right after, right during the Civil War. And um, we also talked about, didn't we talk about um, Maggie Lena Walker and the bank she developed through her mutual aid society. Those were in early chapters. So I focused more on the 20th century here. So we've got Ella Jo Baker from the Young Negroes Cooperative League, Nanny Helen Burroughs, who we can talk about today if we want Cooperative Industries of DC again in the 30s. Helena Wilson, who I keep bringing up at the Brotherhood and the Ladies Auxiliary to the Brotherhood, Estelle Witherspoon by the uh, 60s, Freedom Quilting Bee, that was the picture I already showed you, Freedom Quilting Bee, Fannie Lou Hamer from the 70s, um, did pig banking and Freedom Farm. Um, we can talk about pig banking more later if you want. Peggy Armstrong, who is one of the co-founders of Cooperative Home Care Associates, which is actually the largest worker cooperative yeah. in the United States, and it's mostly let Latina and African-American women owners. 
We've got a bunch of women in the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, Melba Smith, Shirley Sherrard, Shirley Blakely, Alice Paris, Carol Zippert, to name a few of them. And then um, uh, the Ella Baker Intentional Housing Cooperative in Washington, DC, Linda Leakes and Adjua Ipateo. Um, so again, I'm sure you all can mention more and we could think about, maybe I can put this on our resource page and people can add names if they want to honor more women cooperators. Maybe we can think about doing that. Um, and so let me um, take off my screen and I think we'll start with Deirdre because I'm not sure Imani is here yet. So we'll start with Deirdre, how about that? I think, I thought I saw her there. Imani, are you, yeah, I, I saw her on the list. I, I did Imani. make it. But oh, okay. uh, I would- Do you want me to go first? Yes. I can go first if you want me to. Okay, no problem. <laughs> I'm looking at my notes. She said we always want young, we always want to give space for young people to, to, well, to go first. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate okay. that, but I'm still looking over my notes from the chapter. Okay, so. <laughs> right. no problem. No problem. So um, Dr. Nimhart, can I go first then? Should I? Take it away. Okay, okay, great. Um, so good to be here with, with everyone. Um, at first, I was going to do this elaborate slideshow presentation because I couldn't have Kansas show me up. Um, <laughs> and uh, my, 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 my baby cousin, we're a month apart, but I just, you know, I like to, you know, put that in there. There's a younger cousin, but um, I will have to let it stand that he did show me up and he had a presentation and I'm just going to have to speak um, orally. But um, I just want to agree with you. Um, Professor Nimhard, I also really um, in, enjoyed reading this chapter. And again, like with the other chapters, I kept saying to myself, how come I don't know more about this? I drive past Nanny Helen Burroughs all the time, street, road, um, all the time. I used to live in that, that area of, of town. Um, I knew that she was an educator, but I didn't know the extent of which she had started this really you know, impressive uh, co-op movement. So I'm gonna cover like a, like maybe five or six points. I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to do it top level. And I do have a few questions for you that came up as I was uh, reading the chapter. So, you know, the first one, you know, again, as you said in your presentation is about the central role of women in the co-op movement. And, um, and then taking inspiration from previous examples like the St. Luke Penny Savings Bank and, um, and the Women's Guild uh, of Consumer Cooperatives and, and Gary, to show that um, although this chapter is focused on women, there's so many in other chapters, there's a lot of talk about how women were very central um, to these movements. Um, the kind of chapeau I'd like to kind of give my remarks. Uh, one of the things that, that struck me near the end of the chapter was that how you know, cooperatives were not just seen as a means of um, economic survival. In some cases, they very much were, um, especially in the depression area. Um, but also to secure financial autonomy. And so when you look at particularly the ladies auxiliary of the brother, um, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, these were considered the good middle-class job. I mean, people earned a good living. Um, so they weren't necessarily kind of struggling to figure out how they were going to feed their children. Um, so they did have the benefit of a, a, you know, a, a, a fairly good income, but they saw as, um, um, as as the wives of as union wives, a way to um, <clears throat> to have financial autonomy for their families and probably frankly for for themselves and decrease dependency um, uh, as well. Um, I also really took heart with the um, Freedom um, Quilter Cooperative and the fact that they uh, yeah I think it was Freedom Filter my Freedom Farm may have been the same thing but they also saw it as a way to secure people's, uh, these women's ability to participate civically. And I think we take for granted, you know, just having had an election that's been litigated for the umpteenth time, of course, that, you know, our right to be able to go down, cast my vote and not lose my job. And so the fact that this was, you know, um, a risk to people and the fact that the, um, the Freedom Quilted Cooperative were able to buy land. So when people were threatened with getting kicked off their land, they could come and, and you know, still be able to feed their family and participate civically. So I think one of the things that, you know, again, came out to me was how cooperatives are not just a survival mechanism, 
but an autonomy mechanism. And then also um, in terms of uh, the, the freedom cultures, it can also be a tool for political liberation and, and engagement um, as well. Um, I, it's interesting that it, with the DC cooperative, they talked about how the number of people that were involved declined significantly, something from the 400s to more like 70 in the 70s over the course of two years. Um, but as you framed in your book, they found that actually they were more productive when there were fewer members in terms of just you know, um, the benefits per, per member and that part of that might've been because people are more committed. And again, I think that's something that we need to, to look at kind of going forward in terms of, um, you know, yeah, you don't have to have a thousand people to like, to make this a, a big deal that if you've got, um, you know, I don't know the magic number, but a handful of committed people, this could also work. Um, the other point was, again, I thought it was interesting that a lot of these women you talk about a lot of these women um, who had uh, leadership positions in these cooperatives, um, had honed their leadership skills in uh, mutual aid societies, benevolent societies, um, uh, church um, committees as well. And it made me think about, you know, civic engagement today isn't, in many ways, isn't what it was 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago in terms of people being able to have those um, types of organizations and, and be involved in, in homeless leadership skills. And so, you know, it, it also makes me think about like, what are some other mechanisms today that people can, can use, like including KI to, be, to continue to develop for young people to develop those leadership skills and then be able to go on and run um, these, you know, sophisticated uh, cooperatives. And then um, second to last, well, actually, the last is that um, another thing that struck me was the fact that um, this is the cooperative movement is not, you know, in earlier chapters, we talked a lot about like the young people's cooperative movement. Um, and that's exciting. But this isn't just about, you know, young people. It's young people and middle-aged people and older people. It, it's for everybody. And that's heartened for me as someone who's comfortably into <laughs> middle age now. I used to try and fight it, but it is, it is what it is that, you know, you can be 50 and 60 and 70 and beyond and say, you know, this is something I want to do. It's not just a young person thing. So I, I like that. Um, also, um, again, kind of going back to that second point I made that was kind of the chapeau. It's also um, a mechanism that can be used, you know, across classes. It, it's not just if you're trying to figure out like some of the, the co-ops in, in the depression era where you're just trying to survive. I mean, even if you know, you're fortunate that ends are being met, there's, there are cooperative methods that you can use to continue to secure your financial autonomy. So it's for the young, the young at heart <laughs> and, and the not so young, it's for you know, people who, are, you know, who, who, who need to figure out a means of economic survival, but it's also for people who you know, also want to continue to increase their um, economic um, uh, economic autonomy. And then lastly, I had a question for you in terms of, especially some of the more recent um, uh, examples that you gave, like the um, Freedom Quilters Cooperative and, um, and Freedom Farm. And there was one other, I don't think it was, I think Ujamaa is still around, but there were a couple of them that seemed to be, there was the textile, the textile factory they seem to be doing really well and then they ended. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to get a sense of, from you, like what did you find in terms of the ones that were doing really well, like the, the people who you know, bought the textile mill in North Carolina, but then it, it closed again. So that's, uh, I'll end with, with that question. Great, thanks. Um, I love some of your framing. Uh, some, you know, I didn't even think about the framing about the age groups. Um, I love that. Yeah, really helpful. Um, I'll, uh, I just have a couple of comments about what you said, and then I'll end with trying to answer your question. But um, believe me, I don't have a great answer to it. <laughs> um, I wanted to say first about um, the political autonomy. Um, exactly, you're right on. And I often um, talk to groups, that's what I focus on is how 
having the economic independence allows for the political autonomy. And it's something um, that really not just Freedom Quilting Bee did, but like even Fannie Lou Hamer, the whole point of Freedom Farm, Fannie Lou Hamer started out doing voting rights, right? Almost killed, right? Beaten to death just because she was registering people to vote and teaching them how to register to vote. Um, so she at one point pulls back from the voting rights fight and she says, you know what? If we don't have our own economic independence, we can't fight for our political independence because we can't feed us. She was also, she and her husband were also evicted from their sharecropping farm because they registered to vote. So she also, she said, look, we got to get our, our, our economic ducks in order. We got to own stuff together. We got to put food, housing. We've got to get all that together. So Freedom Farm was her way to do collective land ownership, collective farming. She also had a housing project connected to it. There were some, um, some worker co-op uh, daycare centers. She also connected with the new, the, the new um, Head Start programs to do daycare and Head Start, um, uh, federal housing programs to do affordable housing, plus the farming and the owning of the land. Because she said, if we don't have that autonomy economically, then when we go to operate politically, they can retaliate against us. They can take our jobs away. They can throw us off our land, et cetera. So she kind of came at it the other way. She tried to do the political rights first and then said, you need, right? Freedom Quilting Bee kind of, things were happening at the same time with Freedom Quilting Bee and they were seeing that their economic autonomy gave them these other options, helped them to do more in the community for the community and gave the community options because then they could either rent from the Quilting Bee or the Quilting Bee actually sold a couple of um, acres to people who gotten thrown off of their farms. Um, so I think that connection to me has always been really important. In fact, I've done some um, speeches where I say, you know, we can't really achieve full racial equality if we don't get, have economic justice first, if we don't have economic independence, economic justice first. Um, in fact, just a side thing, and maybe I shouldn't be saying this on tape, but um, I had a, um, I gave a talk in the summer, I think, uh, about that topic. I can't remember what we called it. I think we called it ec Economic Black, Black Economic Lives Matter. It was actually a group out of England who were sponsoring a webinar of mine. And I think we called it Black Economic Lives Matter. And do you know Facebook refused the, um, the marketing for that program because for some reason they thought either me or that title was too incendiary or something. Anyway. Um, but that's again, once, right, people for some reason want you to give a platform to QAnon. Right, they want you to talk about <laughs> politics, but not economics, or just a little about politics and nothing about economics. But anyway, sidebar, sorry. Um, but you see how, right, that's, so that's another reason why it's not just about economic survival. We need this economic prosperity so that we can do other things and we're not beholden to other people or um, worried about other people. Um, the other thing you said, oh, now I can't even read my own handwriting. Um, oh, oh, about developing leadership skills. That's the other thing that's so fascinating to look at the black women in the co-op movement, because you can see the development of leadership skills, how they, you know, how their leadership grows either in the different activities they're doing or as advocates for their children or as advocates for their co-op or from their experience in their co-op, they go on to do other leadership. And so it's really fascinating. Um, to see women's leadership through this whole process of looking at the different kinds of cooperatives. And then, um, oh, the last thing about size, right? So yeah, cooperative industries was interesting because it actually morphed into a lot of different things. So it started out, it was basically a, a, what we call a producer's co-op or a worker co-op in terms of the women who were sewing, right? They had 15 women sewing in the basement of the uh, women and girls school that Nanny Helen Burrow started. Um, they had women making, uh, what do they call barrel chairs and brooms and mm -hmm. selling them. Right. Um, and I'm not sure, this is the other frustration. I think I've said this before. So often I do not know all the details. I have snapshot views of these co-ops. And I don't always know how they died because the snapshot view I have was an article or two written when they were coming up or at their height or whatever. Um, and I couldn't find information about how they died. Even in Nanny Helen Burroughs, 
uh, papers, it's not clear exactly how they died. A little bit of the evolution is clear. Like it seems like um, once they got the federal funds, they were able to buy a farm. And so that also changed the nature. A lot of the work went to farming and then bringing uh, fresh produce and stuff back into the city. Um, so there was less emphasis on the industrial part, but I think maybe also things were happening in the economy. If you think about the time period, right, from 33 or 34, when 34 they first 34 to 36, yeah. To, right, right, the new, some of the New Deal policies are kicking uh, in. So it may hmm. be that they didn't, right, they first started out trying to put unemployed women to work. So it's possible women were getting jobs hmm. in the war, right, the w growing yeah. war industry. WPA. And the or, WPA, and so yeah. um, maybe, right, so the, the, you could see how the co-op might be losing members because of that and losing more of their yeah. industrial work. But then mm -hmm. the farm stuff where it was more consumer, right? Then they had a store and the farm produce mm -hmm. bringing into the store. Um, mm -hmm. That was, so that the focus got more on that. Um, even though I think they always still had some of the productive piece, I think they were doing the rooms at least mm -hmm. the whole period because I remember in the yeah. archives actually finding bills of sales about the brooms and mm. people, you know from as far off as mm -hmm. what is that western maryland and western pennsylvania ordering brooms mm -hmm. from dc mm -hmm. um, because they love the brooms that were being made so yeah but i don't mm -hmm. honestly know why everything just right what about some of the newer ones like so even the ones in um in north carolina like the textile factory right. in north carolina so i mean i'm just thinking no, go ahead yeah, no, it's another one that I honestly don't know. The, the the case study I have was studying it sort of at its height and is mostly studying how it started, right? So we have a whole bunch of the whole story about um, the mail was going out of business. Um, the owners were gonna relocate out of the United States. Um, the women, some of the women said, we need our jobs, we need whatever. Um, they were able to put together some money that in that case, they also got federal money because there was that- um, The NAFTA grant. The NAFTA, right. There was the, the money mm -hmm. for the impact of NAFTA, right. right, which enabled them. And they had, they were unionized. So they used their union savings. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that they were able to, because sometimes companies will raid their- right. <laughs> Unfortunately, the workers' pension fund. Right. I, so you know, they one were thing able to use their pension fund. They were mm -hmm. able to use some federal funds, and then they had a farmer, I think, who helped give them some money. So that one, yeah, they were doing really well. When the report that I read, the case study that I read, had them kind of from their beginnings to when they were doing really well. Um, I don't know what happened, but again, remember if you know anything about the textile industry, it was falling apart in North Carolina. Part of the yeah, reason continued to go down. Right, why their initial employer was leaving was because they couldn't make enough profit in, uh, in, the, in that plant, right? Mm -hmm. So it's possible that the economic conditions just continue to deteriorate. Deteriorate, yeah. Um, you know, but and Freedom Quilting Bee, yeah, now Freedom Quilting Bee had a, has a different story. For mm -hmm. them, they were able to, they continued to figure out new markets. So by the mm -hmm. time you were in the early 2000s, they were doing um, uh, not just big quilts, but small little ornamental quilts. And then they were doing sewing, like um, uh, oh, yeah, conference like bags. Bags, bags yeah. Right, conference bags and stuff. So they were able to kind of stay in business because they kept reinventing what mm -hmm. they were making, right? But their problem was succession planning. So uh, they, mm. they didn't do a good enough job of getting their younger people, Young people. to join. So as the older mm. women died and retired, they didn't have enough people coming in. Mm. So they went into mm. hiatus for a while and then tried to restart. Um, and I can't remember if they're still sort of puttering along in the restart, if the restart went for two or three years and then didn't, mm. right? They also, you know, there's also another really, and I'm on tape, so I can't say too much about this other piece, but mm -hmm. there's another sort of sad irony with the quilting bee is that some of their members ended up kind of getting uh, pilfered by the Smithsonian that did a whole um, exhibit. Yeah, I, 
I went to that exhibit. exhibit. I remember it. Oh, I did too. It's a beautiful exhibit, but the sad. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. The sad backstory is that some of those women in the exhibit had been members of Freedom Quilting Bee. Freedom Quilting Bee has one little um, liner note in that whole exhibit, but really Mm. that was like where they were from, but they made more money being connected to the Smithsonian exhibit and things like that. And so the Smithsonian ended up siphoning off some of the quilters. So again, it's one of those sad ironies, right? It's great that they got more attention, but it's not, it, it, right. it, it undermined the co-op a bit. And I've been trying to figure out how to write about that. And right, mm-hmm. anyway. Um, so there's different reasons why some of these last gotcha. and some of them don't. But a lot is about the economic conditions and whether mm. how you weather them. And then the other thing is the succession planning. So that's the other reason why I think your intergenerational mm. stuff is so important because we need mm-hmm. we need people intergenerationally and, and we do need people in different, in some ways in different economic statuses or whatever, because we need that mm-hmm. diversity of all different needs and interests mm-hmm. and commitment, right? And mm-hmm. I think that's what really keeps things going if you've got enough diversity of commitment and you keep bringing mm-hmm. new people in, keep having new ideas about how to keep the co-op going, right? You've gotta be mm-hmm. thinking ahead right you got to always be thinking ahead I think is the answer yeah and I I do want to hand it over to Imani if Imani if you can indulge me 30 more seconds I just wanted to I you know I have in my notes but I was trying to condense them and I made a big mistake and I overlooked the shout out I wanted to give to Chancellor Williams uh, when I saw him show up and um, (laughs) and so Destruction of Black Civilization you know seminal book and also a shout out because my father got a chance to go over to Chancellor Williams' house and meet him and have a whole discussion with him in the late, mama, what was that? Late eighties, it had to be like, or maybe 90, 91, but my dad happened to be in DC on a business trip. and was like, let me go yeah. to the phone book. For kids, um, there used to be these big things, they were called phone books and you would <laughs> open them up and they would I... list people's phone number. Oh. Phone book? Yeah. <laughs> What's a book? Like your cell phone? <laughs> What's the yellow that? pages. You ever hear the yellow pages? Are you, are you talking pages, about Facebook? Right? <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. So he went to the white pages and called like all of the C. Williams and, and, and found, and found him, him and and found him. And then he's like, his grandson is the one that picked up the phone. He's like, oh, I'm looking to speak to Chancellor Williams. He was like, oh, yes, this is Chancellor Williams' residence. He was like, oh, I'd love to speak you know, to you. He's like, oh, that's my grandfather. And he's like, oh, I'd love to speak to your grandfather about his book. And his grandson was like, I didn't even know he wrote a book. But oh, anyway, no. so I know but my dad got a chance to go. And yeah, his grandson didn't even know. He was like 17, 18. But my dad went over there and got a chance to, to, to chat with Chancellor Williams. So when I saw that, I was like, big ups to Chancellor Williams. And then the last thing is, um, I was disappointed to see that some of the men in the brother, the, the BSCP were actually, when the women had ambitions to create this credit union, shut mm-hmm. it down. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, was it really like, oh, this is too risky or were they just hating? I'm just asking. Oh, just um, that out there. that's another one. <laughs> yes, asking. The brotherhood, that was a really disappointing. In fact, um, when you go through the letter, so I learned about this controversy through letters between Helena Wilson and A. Philip Randolph, mm-hmm. right? She give, she was, they had an extensive communication um, because I guess she was in Chicago and he was in Harlem, New York. Um, so she used to write him all these updates about what she was doing, what the, what the auxiliary was doing, what their trials were, whatever. And at this particular time, she's actually telling A. Philip Randolph she's going to resign because she says, you know, she, they've been doing all this hard work in Chicago for this. Um, first, it was a buying club. Then it was a grocery store. The grocery store was dying and she had this great idea, which is a fabulous idea right, to keep the collective money together and use it for a credit union. So then even if the buying store didn't work, they could have a credit union because the the, uh, Brotherhood had already started a credit union in Montreal and had talked about some other credit unions. So she had this wonderful idea, right, to get shot down because the men say, you're just a ladies auxiliary, right? You don't have any real decision-making power about this stuff. So she's ready to resign from president of her she was president of the branch in Chicago, as well as president of the national and international ladies auxiliary. Remember, they call themselves international because they're also in Canada. The Brotherhood was also in Canada. 
she's ready to resign both those positions and, and give it up. And Randolph writes her back and says, please don't give up. Uh, in fact, I almost wrote, I almost na titled the book from a, uh, a quote that he has in that letter because I was so moved by it. He said, I know it's hard, but just remember you're planting the seeds and then, you know, there'll be, you know, we'll have we'll, whatever it's called, you know, we'll have victories and we'll have whatever, but you're planting the seeds mm -hmm. of cooperation. So I originally was going to call the book planting the seeds of cooperation. But then I decided I didn't want to use a quote from a man because I had so many quotes from men. In the home. <laughs> and then there was something else I saw. Something was written called internationally somewhere called Planting the Seeds of Cooperation. I was like, okay, I need something new. So it took right, me another right. year, but then I figured, I found, uh, collect, I thought of collective courage based on something Ella Jo Baker said about courage. Mm. Um, but yeah, so Philip, A. Philip Randolph writes her this beautiful letter right? Don't resign. Don't give up. It's not right. These things take time. It's hard work. We're always going to have, you know, whatever, and please don't resign. Um, and so she doesn't resign, mm -hmm. but she did pull herself off of some of those co-op right. stuff because she said, right. I'm seen as the face of the ladies auxiliary, but we have no power. So I have to, I'm going to remove myself as a, as a rep from the ladies auxiliary. Um, and she was, you know, she didn't stop being involved in stuff, but right, right. that had to be heartbreaking. Lie. That was a very emotional part of the yeah. book for me is when she was speaking about, you know, how she was satisfied with the work that she had done. Um, but there was something very relatable and uh, just very sad to me about her words that she was content to bow out and kind of forget that the whole thing even happened. And uh just like as a young person trying to like come up uh, in the civic space and uh, promote my ideals and, you know, just make the institutions and create the world that I want to see. It often does feel like the opposition is too strong and powerful to surmount. So in that way, I could totally understand and like put myself in her position of just wanting to be done with it, even after her immense commitment of, you know, several decades to that kind of work it can still become too much for people. Right. Yeah. And remember, she was also, she didn't want there to be a fight with the man, right? That was the other piece. She was like, I'm not going to split us up. I'm not going to make this a huge fight, the women against the men or whatever. I'm not going to, right? I'm just not going to do that. So that was the other piece, I think, that she was, you know, and again, right, we have those stories from the Black Panthers too, right? Remember? Some of the women just said, whatever, we're not going to fight because we don't want the, we don't want there to be this big riff when we know what the right. real issue, you know, not the real, but you know what I mean? We know what the bigger yeah, the issues are. We have to figure <laughs> yeah. out either to do it internally, right? We have to figure out how to handle it quietly internally, or we've got to move on or something. So, you know, it's, yeah. I think it is an issue for black women, right? When do you stand up for the rights of black women, even if it looks like you're fighting black men? Um, mm -hmm. Or how else do you handle, right? How else do you handle these things? And we have lots of different ways that people mm -hmm. have handled it through history, right? Some have made a big fight about it. Um, some have chose to be more quiet about it. Some have gone, you know, kind of just gone and done their own thing and, and moved on. Um, so, but yeah, really, really interesting. Um, and I agree with you about Chancellor Williams. He was one of my heroes. I was so excited because, you know, I had been saying before I even found that, that, you know, name me a black leader and I'll show you something about a co-op that they've been involved in. And I was like, I don't know if I can do it. You know, I wasn't sure about Martin Luther King, but then I found out he was trying to create a, a credit union before he died. You know, I wasn't sure about some of these guys, but then I saw Chancellor Williams. I was like, yes, yes. You know, and the same thing with Abram Harris in the art in the chapter. Which chapter was that? I guess the one we just did, right, where he was writing to Du Bois about, and that he also helped the um, Young Negroes Cooperative League to have their DC conference. Um, and I know most of you don't know Abram Harris, but he's a famous black economist. And so I was happy to see some of these people were showing up in this co-op movement because I was saying they're all there. <laughs> you just have to find it. Um, but we need to give um, Imani her chance. Okay. Uh, well, y'all already covered <laughs> 
um, a lot. So I'm just going to, uh, I guess, echo a lot of what was said. Um, it was just so um, beautiful and, you know, also sometimes uh, heartbreaking to read about these um, these cooperatives. Um, like Burroughs was just amazing. Like, I don't know how she had time to do <laughs> all the things that she did, um, but she did it. Um, the, uh, let's see. Yeah, um, like also what was already said, how a lot of this was not just, um, well, it, it went beyond, you know, securing um, the, the financial needs of families and, and really had the goal of uh, economic justice for, for Black folks, um, you know, outside of, you know, whole communities. Um, where, or, you know, whole regions, um, like, um, uh, the, uh, like you mentioned, like the broom sales, like, you know, everybody was just like, yes, like, this is a good product we want to support. And, um, that was, it was just all very, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was all really beautiful. Um, so some of the things that stood out to me, um, a lot was already mentioned. Uh, so one thing, like the quilting bee, um, the fact that you know the the group, the co-op, not only built a factory, but then secured land for you know folks that had been kicked off of their land for exercising their right. Um, to like assemble because I think it was they went to like a uh, uh, what was it to go in here, Dr. King speaker? Yeah, it was an MLK yeah. speech. Yeah, an MLK yeah. talk. So, yeah, yeah, and so um, and so the fact that they you know by the end had like twenty three plus acres for folks, and then in addition had like child care and after school care and tutoring services and just like. It wasn't just it wasn't just the you know we have this place where you know you can come and earn but it was actually a place where you know where not only like we said before it's not just about you know um, securing the economics for families it was providing so much more beyond that um, when it came to just like impacting folks' lives and you could tell that. Um, like in that case, and then um, there was another one, the, well, with both that one, the sewing um, collective and then the home care, like how, just how the, these workplaces were set up where it was like, you know, we're gonna um, join with this other um, organization so we can provide health insurance. And, um, you know, I think that for that one, they were like, they provided full-time work and then like the turnover was like very, very low considering what the industry or when looking at like the industry as a whole um, and that, you know, people had input when it came to the hours that they um, were working and what their wages were and like how the wages were distributed am amongst like, different um, like uh, uh, like uh, seniority, I guess. Um, and then like bonuses and stuff like that. Those were all things that were um, talked about by these folks and um, made it something that not only worked for them, but um, a allowed for um, members to, to thrive. And then with the home care, like that was astounding to read about like just how large it was um, and how there was the system where it was like, okay, you come in, you learn about um, this organization and then you have room to grow and expand and, um, you know, 
uh, leading your own way and how it was constantly growing. And I think that one thing that just constantly struck me about this was just like, you know, the, the, the perseverance and creativity. So like with the home care, they were like, we're going to do this. And then we're also going to work with um, folks who um, are specifically dealing with like, um, like ability, like disability issues and stuff like that. And so just making sure that um, and like what was mentioned before with the quilting bee, it was like, okay, we did quilts, we're going to do conference um, merch and stuff like that. It was just, just looking to see like what's going to work and then, you know, pivoting to, to, um, to, to make it work for, for them as they um, grew. Um, what else do I have here? Uh, yeah, like um, like the mill. Oh yeah, yeah, that was sad. The mill, because I was like, oh, I was, you know, they they were doing so well, and it was like the sales were up in like five million, and um, and then it just kind of. But um, it was still something, and you could tell by the way um, the reports that you um, drew from were written, how much um, just like in awe people were of the fact that it was like, hey, we took this, this plant that this mill that was closing and made it work. We secured funding and made it and, and had a, a really great thing going there for, for a while. So, um, and then, oh yeah, the Ella Jo Baker houses, uh, housing uh, collective where they bought all the row houses for like a dollar. I was like, come on, like in DC. Um, so that was really cool to read about because I was born in DC and like so many places that I knew when I was there are just like, they're just not, it's, you know, it's a whole different city. But um, so uh, that was really beautiful to read about. And I, I just the whole time I was just like, wow. <laughs> just like it was it was just it was just uh really astounding and um uh and you know just really uh beautiful and enjoyable and uh yeah just the the creativity and the drive uh it was yeah <laughs> sorry I think I rambled a lot but yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you were fabulous. You were fabulous. Yeah, you you were. said you didn't have much to say, and then you just, yeah, said a lot. Yeah, started <laughs> saying it. <laughs> um, I wanted to go back a little bit to Burroughs and something that was similar between Burroughs and Helena Wilson, Nanny Helen Burroughs and Helena Wilson. Both mm -hmm. of them end up being spokespersons for the co-op movement beyond the co-op the specific co-op that they were involved in. So Nanny Helen Burroughs, one of the other things that you see in her letters and her papers that I found at the Library of Congress, um, there was a DC um, co-op council and she actually attended those meetings and there are letters of from the whoever was the head of that asking her to like represent them at these other meetings and go talk to people about co-ops and stuff. So they mm -hmm. saw her because she was such an already a national figure, articulate figure. Um, so it's also really, I mean, it makes it even more surprising that still those of us who even knew about her didn't realize about the co-op stuff because they actually sent her out to represent the DC co-op council or whatever. She gave speeches about co-ops. I don't have any copies of those speeches, but I have letters saying, you know, can you speak on this day? And her saying, yes, I can be there, that kind of thing. So, um, and the same thing turns out with Helena Wilson. She, um, not only did she write, she had a sort of a regular column in the Black Worker, which was the, um, uh, the Brotherhood's uh, magazine. And in her, most of her columns, she was writing about consumer economics and economics and cooperatives and stuff like that. But she also then ended up being the spokesperson. She was the liaison to the Chicago Labor Council. Um, and then, you know, even after the whole fiasco with the um, 
uh, with the Brotherhood uh, store, buying club and store, she was on, uh, uh, the, I guess it's the Chicago Labor Council's advisory committee or something, and they put on some conferences, and then they opened up a, a Chicago eye clinic co-op for uh, labor union members. And um, she was able, she got the Ladies Auxiliary to donate some of the founding money for that. So they were considered founders um, and they got recognition as the only black women group that contributed to this um, regional co-op. Uh, so there's lots of interesting, right? Things happening through and with these people, right? That we don't know about unless you like really, I guess what I did was I just scrutinized all this stuff, right? I was like, I gotta find out what these people were doing when I had any data, which was these papers, right? Cause we also have the papers from the Brotherhood and the Ladies Auxiliary um, in Chicago Historical Society and in the um, Labor Library at Berkeley, California. So both of those two places had archives for the Brotherhood, including archives for the Ladies Auxiliary. And that's where I was able to find so much of this out. And then, as I said, um, one of Helena Wilson's relatives sent me a few little things to help me piece together some other stuff that was happening, especially out in um, Oakland. Um, but yeah, so to find out that actually they were pretty well known in the broader co-op community was also interesting, even though, you know, when I talked to the co-op community, they didn't know anything about those people, those histories. But at the time, right, you can see from the letters that they were they were involved. So that's another really interesting thing. So the black women actually had respect in the broader mainstream US co-op community, at least in the 30s and 40s. So that's another really interesting thing. Um, the other thing I, for me about Freedom Quilting Bee and all the other family supporting programs they had, right? That's another thing for me about when you look at what women do in economics, right? We always are kind of doing things to balance our family responsibilities, our home responsibilities, and our feelings of responsibility to community, right? And so most of the time, that's where the mutual aid societies, most of these co-ops, the women's co-ops are always kind of looking at what do we do with the children? How do we support them, right? What do we do with the young people? What do we do about housing, milk, right? Um, we saw in the last chapter, the milk co-ops that the women in some of the um, housing co-ops were doing to make sure the families all had good access to food and milk, right? So it's really interesting also to see that when women do co-ops, even cooperative home care associates, when women do co-ops, they try to do as much as they can you know, to spill over to the whole other parts of their lives, right? They're not just compartmentalizing their economic stuff and their work life. They're solving a bunch of different problems when they can, when they have that control over their work life, you can see that they use it to solve a bunch of different problems. Um, and the last thing I was gonna say, oh, and the other thing that was really interesting about cooperative home care is its policy advocacy. Um, they realized very early on, and this was partly because they were um, developed by a nonprofit that had this vision of creating a, a very strong uh, worker-friendly uh, co-op in a very underappreciated, depressed, exploited industry, right? So they were they spent a lot of time thinking about all the pieces. But one of the things they did was in order to be able to pay, uh, the co-op members a living wage or at least a competitive, you know, a decent wage in an industry that usually, um, you know, people pay the least, not the most that they can. They actually created um, citywide and statewide advocacy. They organized with other home care uh, organizations, which normally would be their competitors, right? But they organized with them to petition the city of New York as well as the state of New York to increase um, Medicare uh, allocations to home care so that in the state of New York, every all the home care wages were higher than normal because of the petitions that they did. And so then even their competitors were doing higher wages. So when they were demanding higher wages, it wasn't so such a big, wasn't so much higher that they were priced out or not competitive. And so that kind of a strategy is also really important Right. How do you, you know, 
how do you pull your whole industry up? You know, understanding that pulling what you can do in your co-op can be even double or tripled if you can bring the whole industry up. How can you cooperate? How can you think about right advocacy and collective cooperation on a different level, even though these people are competing with you for who's going to hire the workers, right? So there's a really interesting um, interconnection there also with that kind of far sight of um, uh, po political advocacy and policy advocacy. And then also um, the unionization and how important their union, the SDIU, originally the 1199 chapter of what's now SCIU, um, they joined it very early on and they were able to use the fact that they were unionized to also help promote a lot of the the, the, the things that they cared about in terms of uh, uh, condition, working conditions and health care and that kind of thing. So they were able to work hand in hand with their union. So lots of interesting um, lessons for how to do this stuff right um, if you read the details about each of these kinds of co-ops. I really um, liked how um, one, I can't remember which uh, organization it was specifically, but they talk about how um, using like government subsidies and like government grants to essentially make up for the lack of initial capital, like financial capital in these communities right. in the beginning. They're like, okay, we can get you know, a couple, like they got like $10,000 from the government and they're like, okay, we're going to make this money work for the community as best we can. You know, we're going to use that money initially to start up our uh, cooperative organization as best we can and yeah. make it sustainable. So when they take that money away, we're already in business. Right. Uh, and I thought that was very, very smart. In yeah, terms actually of a couple of them production. did that, I think. So cooperative mm -hmm. industries, that's where they bought the farm with some of that government money. I think both of the um, sewing companies in North Carolina also did that, used some um, either subsidies or government funds. Um, and, but you're right, there's again, the strategy of it, right? We don't wanna be dependent on that money, but we want what we, you know, but we deserve access to it and then we're gonna use it smartly, right? To either for infrastructure or for, to get us through the first year or whatever it is. Um, exactly. Also, also, Kenneth has a question. He's been, that has stuck out to me was how they used, especially the uh, cooperative home care associates. And then there was another one, but that they focused on developing the leadership of the women and educating and training them. And so, and even I can't remember one, they said they, they had tried doing it with men and women and they found that it didn't work as well. So, you know, they had to keep it separate. But to me, I'm really working with low income uh, women. And so it made me think about, you know, because, you know, in the African American community, predominantly, especially low income, um, our households are, are single uh, family headed households of women. And it seemed like, you know, in those instances, um, they try to go in and assess or identify what are the skills that the women have? How can they help them to um, develop their skills, how can they help them to move up in terms of leadership and those kind of things. So to me, you know, you know, it's like, how can we apply that today, especially when we have so many public housings and things like that in our community and single uh, headed households with women who, with low um, skills or being paid low paid wages. So how can we recreate that kind of, um, I guess you would say effort and it's not and, and which, you know, <laughs> Randolph spoke to it wouldn't be easy, but you know I felt like you know there's you know a lot of talk about you know uh, economic justice for women, you know political empowerment for women. So you know it would be interesting to see if you know we could create a model that you know works with women, low income, to try to come up with an industry, but also you know provide them with opportunities to develop leadership, move up into management. And the other thing I think I think was the uh, Cooperative uh, Home Care Association, they were flexible too in the way that I think they says had something about sometimes people could cash in their um, vacation days if they needed additional money, you know, so like they didn't have to take vacation day, they could work, but they need that money and they could cash in. So to me, I really like the creativity and the flexibility, but the focus on, you know, helping women to develop their leadership capabilities, figure out what skills they have that they could offer or uh, uh, create a cooperative around 
that would allow them to have a more uh, living wage and then be able to begin to stabilize their families. And right. community. Yeah. Yeah. That was um, Cooperative Economics for Women in Boston did some of that. And that's the group that said they found it was easier to train women separately from men. And then Cooperative Home Care did a lot of what you're saying too. And you're right. I mean, I was really excited about, right, how do you take these really low wage, hyper exploitative industries and turn them around so that women are running them, right? Women are controlling them, running them, making um, them uh, actually, you know, living wage uh, benefited jobs, you know, having uh, vacation, sick leave, uh, retirement, right? Union being unionized, all that stuff in these jobs that normally are just, you're just hyper exploited in um, and make it, and being able to grow them and grow women's leadership in them, I think, right? That was one of the things that made me really excited about worker co-ops in general, but also to look at the ones that are working with women. Uh, Kenneth, you're on mute. Hey, uh, how are you, Professor? Good, good, good. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you one one question, uh, and, and I'm going to try to make this brief because I see my aunt Paulette is falling asleep. I also, <laughs> want to, I also want to say uh, what a great job, Imani Faith Willis Henderson. You did uh, what you did an in, incredible job, and I like your T-shirt, Mimi. That's an awesome T-shirt. Thank you for that, for wearing that. Anyway, um, and now I look like a perv because I'm looking at everyone's shirts and stuff. But anyway, so um, what I wanted to say was that, you know, I was thinking, let me just tell you that Dr. King is my hero. Uh, you know, I went to Morehouse College and that was the other thing I wanted to say that I did de beat Deidre in the last performance uh, here, but also I beat her earlier in life that I chose Morehouse and she went to Columbia too. But anyway, that's that's not the story I wanted. To, she couldn't go there anyway, but um, <laughs> So, uh, so, uh, but, 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 you know, it upsets, and I think this is, this might be something that I, I will write about, and I wanted to ask you your opinion on it. It sounds like King, you know, his push for integration may have divested the interest in um, uh, co-ops, you know, and the NAACP was doing the same thing. So it wasn't just him. But I, I wonder two things. It seems as if white businesses would have been happier for integration to have happened earlier on instead of fighting it. I guess that's, I, I'm not, I wanted, wanted you to talk about that, see if you can. And then the second thing is that, um, was that a problem? Do you, do you think that, uh, that, that he didn't consider well enough uh, the black co-ops uh, before his his like his his uh, push to integrate, and that that's all the questions that I have. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, good questions as usual. Um, this stuff is complicated, and I think we all know that all our black leaders, men and women alike, are very complicated human beings, right? And we normally, again, just see a, shot, a snapshot, snapshot of them, right? We're inundated with just one, you know, we just, all we know is his speech, or actually we only know the last paragraph of his, I have a dream speech, right? Most people, I think we've talked about this before, maybe we didn't, don't even realize that he starts out his I have a dream speech with about reparations, right? That the U.S. owes us a blank check for all the stuff they said they were going to give and do right but nobody talks about that they only talk about i have a dream that our children will sit next to each other and be happy or whatever um so yeah so there's lots of complications i think the bigger question is about integration in general not just um dr king um and but i do want to say the last thing about dr king specifically and then i'll do integration in general um remember he did evolve and by the time he was killed and why he was killed was because he actually started talking about economics, right? The poor people's campaign. And if you read his later speeches, they're all about what's wrong with the economy, right? They're both what's wrong with the economy and anti-Vietnam war. And those two, that combination 
really is what got him killed, right? Nobody cared. I mean, they pretended to care when he talked about integration, but they didn't really care that much. It was when he was talking about that we need a whole revolution of values and we need to change our economic system and there shouldn't be poor people, right? That's when people got on him. So I don't know. I, I always hope that he was moving toward cooperatives, right, in his um, poor people's campaign, because it seems to me that would be a natural move to, well, how do we stop people from being poor, right? And as I said, I found out he was at some point interested in starting a credit union, so he did start to have some ideas of what cooperativism could achieve. So I'm thinking maybe if he had lived longer, um, he might have started talking about cooperativism. But your bigger issue about does integration or has integration sort of undermined our ability to do more or better cooperative economics and right, to engage in that way. You know, I think we did talk about this with the boy. It was the same thing was the argument Du Bois had with the NACP and he finally resigned from the NACP because the NACP was like, we're about integration. That's what we were. That's what we were founded for. They didn't even know how to talk about this voluntary economic segregation they couldn't even figure out how to work it into their platform or how to pivot. Um, and so I think you're right that because we believed for several, at least several decades, if not century, that integration was going to be the thing that saved us, right? If we could just, some of us get a piece of that pie, right? That that would save us. I think everybody sort of put their apples in that basket, right? Let's integrate, right? Um, and then it was only after people saw sort of how hollow integration was um, and how superficial it was that then some groups, right? And then, you know, the, the groups that want, that talked about self-segregation got demonized, right? The, the Black Panther Party, the um, Nation of Islam, right? All the black nationalists, right? They're like, everybody hated them, the whites and the blacks, because it was easier to demonize and to talk about how horrible they were and that they had the wrong values and whatever than to talk about what they were really talking about, which is that we have to come to get, we have to control our own economics and be able to support ourselves and develop ourselves from a position of strength before we can become integrated if we want to, or we could, decide not to. You know, at the 50th anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Ed, people started coming out even talking about that decision, right, to, to, to integrate education might have been the wrong thing that we should have been arguing, continuing to argue more strongly for equality of education. And the assumption that education is better if you're integrated because then we're getting white education, right? That whole assumption is really false, right? Because blacks don't get educated better when they're with white groups, or at least not always, right? It's not foolproof. And, you know, don't get me started. I keep forgetting I'm on tape. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great. You're doing great. Hey, 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 I got a yeah, great question, you know, and I have on a nice shirt too, man. You can go ahead and tell people how great my shirt is. I'm still, I'm, I'm still waiting, man. Go ahead. Um, I think the difference for me it's assimilation, integration. We often mix those two up. Right. That to have access, integrate, is not the same as assimilate, which is to be and act like uh, your oppressor. Now, it's, it's <laughs> every time we make a step forward, white supremacy morphs and becomes something other than it was before. We see the same thing now with the Black Lives Matter movement. So, so everybody's now is. Or racial equity. Uh, corporations, some of them are now exploiting that for the, the benefit of their own economies, et cetera. So, um, and even integration, if we're honest about it, those of us who've been able to access those spaces really have not really been able to assimilate with power, not most of us. So we just happen to have a seat at the table and rarely have any opportunity to decide what's on the menu. Even we outperform and out and out or out educated from those other places. So it's complicated. And then I like to ditto what Pressure said that we all are human beings in the midst of growth and development. So who we were yesterday, if we're growing, we won't be the same person tomorrow. So same as it relates to uh, Dr. King. 
Yeah, thanks. Great, great points. And yeah, I really love your distinction. Um, right. It's assimilation that we really are trying to fight against or, or not or not succumb to. Integration doesn't have to be a problem if we're not wearing, if we're not trying to assimilate, right? But we need to integrate from a position of power or right, we need to have some control over our own lives. We need to be prosperous in our own right if we're if we're going to be able to make the best of the opportunities of integration. And if integration is going to mean that we're not just assimilated and assumed into under other people's stuff. Right. right. And that's to me, that's that's the challenge, right? How do we make sure that whatever we do, we don't have to give up who we are, what we are, what we want, what we need, what our children and families and communities need, right? We need to be able to go into whatever opportunities without having to give up that stuff. And to me, that means we have to control our economics um, because most of the time that's how we're controlled, right? We're controlled because we either need a job or we need food or we need a house, right? And so if we can control that, if we can control, create it under the conditions that we want, which is what some of the examples, especially in chapter seven showed, women creating what they needed, what they wanted in their way. Um, and then whatever happens after that, you've got, right, you're in control, you've got that that base, that stable base that you're in control of. Um, so for me, that's sort of, uh, that's the important part. I guess we're out of time. I just, let me pull up my slides one last time because I have homework for Kwanzaa. Um, we, uh, in the spirit of Kwanzaa, and it's in Kwanzaa will be, uh, okay, am I trying to get my screen to move? There we go. Um, you know, Kwanzaa, everyone's supposed to give gifts to people, right? So the gift is I want everyone to be able to come and tell me your favorite co-op quote or your favorite co-op example. Um, remember, you're supposed to be reporting back about your homework, about trying to find other co-ops in your area, in your history, in your family's history, or in your local area. Um, so people need to come back ready to report back what they're finding. Um, and then I also want people to be willing to talk about what are they gonna do in 2020 to further the black co-op movement. Um, we need two people to give reflections on chapter eight, which is about uh, black rural co-op development in the 20th century. Um, and happy Kwanzaa. Can you drop that uh, slide in the chat so that I can I can email it to myself. I'll try. I'm not sure I can. Yeah. Um, of it, Mrs. Fair, I can email it to you. Please. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. That's see, this is where the young people need to figure this stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> I could barely get my slideshow back on and moving again. <laughs> I also took a screenshot of it, so I can uh, send out an email about it. Oh, just great. oh wonderful. When, when you send out the email notices to everyone as a reminder for the 28th, please stick that on there and say Kwanzaa homework. Yeah, for sure. So, so the 28th is the Ujima. I don't know how many of you follow Kwanzaa, but it's the Ujima principle, which is collective work and responsibility. So it's very apt. Uh, the 29th is co-op is Ujima, which is cooperative economics. So the day after we're meeting um, is the cooperative economics day. Um, but also, you know, Kuji Chakalia is about self-determination. Right, so a lot of the principles of Kwanzaa connect with what we're talking about. So that's why I wanted us to kind of recognize that we'll be meeting during Kwanzaa. We've got Kwanzaa principles that connect with what we've been talking about, what we will talk about. And so I'd love for everybody to kind of participate. As I said, we're all supposed to kind of give each other something. And so to me, make let's make sure everybody talks and can talk about this subject and what, you know how we see ourselves as um, collective people. Will do. Thank you, Dr. Nimhart. Yeah, anybody want to very very enlightening. Thank you. you I did great. actually. Em said you didn't get the volunteers. Oh, right. Sorry, we didn't get the volunteers. Right, we need two volunteers for chapter eight. I volunteer Mimi since it touches on food. OK, great. Oh, wonderful. Mimi wanted to say something also. 
And then we need Em said person, that was but... foul. That was foul. Uh, Gila volunteer Mimi. I'm remembering yeah, that. That's part of my wife privileges. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have a second? Or somebody find me a second by next by next time. Who's on the call? What about I think Cassandra's on here. Or Trey. I don't think Trey, have you gone yet? Yeah, yeah. Oh Trey. Mm. <laughs> Trey was in there like I'm in the background. I thought Trey. I was getting away. Simone, my wife oh, says she'll Cassandra do it. Came off mute oh, too. okay. What's your wife's name? Simone. Well, she can speak for herself. Simone. Simone. Hey, okay, Simone. Great. Hi, Simone. Oh. Hey, Simone. You gonna do it Hello. now? I was called in here while I was eating my dinner. <laughs> okay, great. We'll be excited to have both Mimi and Simone. And then Mimi, you had wanted to say something, so go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just gonna say, so, um, you know, we talk a lot at Kepper about community wealth building and trying to define that beyond just financials, but also some of these other elements of what makes us like healthy and whole and um, maybe more intangible things. And I feel like you spoke to that really well throughout the chapter and especially in like the summary at the end um, about how, you know, these co-ops like gave people hope and change their lives and like gave them meaning and new community and help them figure out how to care for their children and grow their leadership and just like gave them joy and and and, and like and space to be empowered and like all of these different beautiful things that's at the heart to me of community wealth building so i just really appreciated the way that um even in a study of economics in like a you know kind of an academic text about a lot of the history you spoke to those pieces really well and provided some really tangible examples of what community wealth building looks like and how it's such it's it's also such an important outcome of that collective work that people do together so i just really appreciated that oh thank you so much thanks for bringing that up because that is sort of like my whole purpose of all this work, right, right, is for us to see, right, what community wealth can, could be, how we should be trying to fashion it, and why we should be wanting community wealth more than even individual wealth. So you just said it beautifully. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for calling our attention to it before we left today. Um, and um, so I think that's a good thing to end on. I don't even have anything better that I could say. <laughs> Um, just happy holidays, right? This is the time when we're supposed to be enjoying family and trying to get some balance back in our lives. So please do that. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing you on the other side, or I guess in the middle of the holidays and um, look forward to celebrating Kwanzaa with everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye.